boa tarde a todas e todos. Bem-vindos ao segundo dia do, do Colégio de Estudos Globais, em torno da obra do professor David Tell Goldberg. Como sabem, estas sessões uh, serão em inglês e, portanto, passo, pa, pa, passo então as apresentações em inglês. Uh, so it's a very great honor to uh, present the second day of our School of Global Studies around the work of uh, distinguished guest professor David Theo Goldberg, uh, director of the Humanities Research Institute of the University of California, and uh, one of the most important voices in debates around critical race theory and digital humanities. Uh, professor Goldberg yesterday gave us his lecture titled Tracking Capitalism, the Political Economy of Algorithmic Culture. We had a debate after the lecture, and today we'll have um, a conversation uh, in the first moment uh, with two um, uh, researchers from SES, and then a workshop with the title Racism, sorry, the conversation, the conversation is around racism and racial state in intersection with uh, digital humanities. And the workshop uh, is titled Rethinking the Humanities, Problems, Opportunities, and Prospects. Uh, so let me introduce the speakers in the conversation, uh, which will last around uh, 40 minutes. So um, we'll have Professor Goldberg, we'll have Bruno Sena Martins, a senior researcher at the Center of, for Social Studies. Uh, Bruno is co-coordinator of the doctoral program Human Rights in Contemporary Societies. He was the vice president of SEJ Scientific Board. He lectures in the PhD programs Postcolonialisms and Global Citizenship and Human Rights in Contemporary Societies. His research interests include body, disability, human rights, racism, and colonialism, and his work can be found in scientific journals and several published books as editor and author. Irina Veliku is a researcher, also from SESH, working on social environmental conflicts in post-communist Europe. Uh, she's currently the principal investigator of the Just Food FCT project, expanding her work by looking at food justice. Irina holds a PhD in political science from the University of Hawaii and an MA in international studies from the University of Warwick. Uh, Irina worked as a Marie Curie experience researcher within the entitled European Network of Political Ecology and her recent publications can be found in journals such as environmental politics, theory, culture, and society, ecological economics, geoforum, new political science, and globalizations. Thank you all for your participation. Uh, and Paula, you know, the floor is yours for the questions that will launch the conversation. OK, thank you, Tiago, very much. Thank you all for being here, and especially for, again, to David, for the challenging lecture that you gave yesterday about surveillance capitalism, reflecting indeed how the power of an alg algorithmic or governmentality is very intimately coupled with new varieties of subordination, exploitation, and silencing alternatives. And I'm going to pose to the three of you a broad question, hoping that from different perspectives you could tackle it. Indeed, we wonder about how the nation state uh, political legacy still in many countries is behaving under those conditions of this new surveillance capitalism. For instance, the case of Twitter recently in the US silencing a president is a good example as the relationship between public and private powers is not yet settled. In the, this case of Twitter, it was a decision taken by private powers to protect democracy in the US. However, how do you think how it will be applied in other political and epistemic contexts where these companies are, have economic interests and are really probably not very interested in protecting other democracies? 
they are more interested in protecting their markets? Will they also be interested in protecting democratic values in other worlds, for example, in Brazil? How to challenge the neoliberal tracking capitalism, which is actively occluding its own historical roots, the intimate relationship of capitalism with colonialism and racism? How can we foster solidarity across struggles when this presentism is the norm? As you all in different areas of research and of militancy are using the web, how do you think from your own experience that we can decolonize the web, making it more diverse, more objective, more common, more a common good? How to integrate the voices of activists resisting discrimination and environmental racism? How to broaden the current policies of affirmative action and the environmental activism beyond the current limitations of the web? I know this is a huge question, but it's Tiago and myself. It was the big kicking question that we thought the three of you could be interested in tackling. And thank you. Thank you, Paula. And um, good afternoon to everyone. Um, Thank you, David, for your lecture yesterday. It was challenging and inspiring. I think more challenging because uh, the challenges are, are huge. So um, uh, I was thinking on, on the reflections that were put yesterday. And in one sense, I see that this idea to be important that technology is not neutral. And of course, it's unequally distributed and we now are facing the dangers of a public sphere dominated by algorithms. And this public sphere is prone to favor targeted advertising, uh, favors hate speech and fake news. In Jared Kushner's famous words, controversy elevates the message and also favors an environment where anonymity is a privileged space of enunciation for right-wing populisms and racial nationalisms. And of course, now we have um, a director's cut on which uh, the private social media monopolies can uh, remove accounts or posts at their will. So in that sense, it seems crucial, as David was telling us yesterday, to look to the political economy of the algorithm, algorithmic culture. In light of what Shilma Bimb recently in a talk, in a conversation with David, uh, Professor David said, uh, a genealogy of modernity that places racial capitalism at its art as a cauldron of which the idea of black and blackness was produced. But now on the bright side, uh, as David stressed yesterday, technology is double-edged and can be mobilized by historically oppressed groups. And I think that the example of Black Lives Matter is an important one to think about these contradictions. Uh, as you know, uh, from 2014, after the acquittal of George Zimmerman, accused of murder, uh, there was an hashtag Black Lives Matter that was coined by three black women, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cancullers, and Opal Tometi. And gradually, Black Lives Matter uh, movement materialized into, into a growing national network of protests, opposing racially motivated violence against Black people. Uh, by the end of 2020, following the footage of the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Demonstrations supporting Black Lives Matter reached an unprecedented international visibility. The mobilization prompted by the mur murder of George Floyd had in fact a remarkable global impact. And it contributed to the articulations of anti-racist agendas in different national contexts. Um, and I want to, to think about these events, important events in our recent history, um, uh, establishing a dialogue with David's work. And I want to make two questions to David, direct questions to, to David. Uh, David, 
proposes in his uh, book, The Threat of Rice, an important chronology uh, of broad anti-racist mobilization. And he singles out three moments. The first would be abolitionism throughout the 19th century. The second would be anti-colonialism and the civil rights movements from roughly the, the, uh, nine, uh, the beginning of the century to the 60s. And then the anti-apartheid and multicultural movement from the 70s to the 1990s. And my questions, David, would be, first, how do you look to this chronology from the present day? Putting in another way, do you see the protests that followed the merger of George Floyd as constituting a fourth moment in this broad anti-racist mobilization? Uh, if so, uh, another question would be, oops, another question would be, um, you also talk about regional, regionally prompt, parameters and promoted racism linked to their national state formation. So you talk about racial Americanization, racial Palestinization, racial Latin Americanization, racial South, Af South Africanization. My question is, if racism, as you say, have an history of traveling and transforming in their circulation, do you think that we can now talk about uh, an era in which maybe we are seeing a tendency of anti-racism to become a kind of an, uh, an Americanization of anti-racism? Uh, racism. Do you think that we face the danger of a global anti-Americanization anti of anti-racism in the sense that there is an asymmetrical impact of national local histories uh, in what are the grammars of resistance that are traveling uh, in transnational agendas. So we, know, we don't know much, for example, in Europe about roads must fall. Uh, we don't know much international about the reality in, in Brazil, in other places. So how do you, how do you see this, this circulation, this asymmetrical circulation? So this would be my, my first uh, intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. It's a really, really interesting set of remarks. Let me just preface before I say anything in direct response. Um, uh, <clears throat> we lost uh, two giants of anthropological theory and ethnography in the last two days. Mm -hmm. And I just want to pay um, respects to the their spirit, uh, both Marshall Salins and um, Paul Rabinow, whatever you think of the substance of their work had an incredible imprint um, on, uh, as I say, anthropological, both theory and ethnography. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge that their uh, uh, passing um, uh, and not let it go without mention. Uh, silence two days ago, Robin, yesterday. Um, uh, so thank you. These are really, really, really interesting uh, set of questions. Um, uh, so let me uh, let me begin by saying that I think what you're pointing to is an important insight in this in in a double sense, both um, both temporally and. Um, geopolitically, let's put it in those terms. Uh, temporally in the sense that the new configurations around uh, uh, the technological, these new forms of technology that have been marking our lives for at least the last 20 years, if not um, 30, um, uh, uh, manifest new uh, or renewed, not altogether new, renewed forms of, of, uh, of racist expression and the grappling with how to come to terms with them, right? Uh, on the one hand, and then that, you know, as you, as you point out, Bruno, um, the way these things travel geopolitically, um, um, both take on new form, I mean, the fact that we're so more deeply interlinked, even if virtually now, 
than before, um, the quickening up of the pace of both knowledge of and interaction with different instances in different places um, uh, lead to new configurations of expression. Right or renewed, as I say, uh, configurations of expression, and and I think you're right to point out that Black Lives Matter um, uh, represent um, uh, an important moment, instance, expression uh, of this outcome, precisely because it's been taken up. I, I mean, it emerged from the U.S., particularly from the West Coast, right? Um, and, uh, and has been taken up in different places uh, in, in different ways and interacted with local expressions on the ground, you know, not least in South Africa, in Brazil, but also in Europe uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in various ways. I mean, um, and, and there's a, almost an immediate prehistory of that. I mean, if you think of Ferguson, uh, you know, whatever it was, five years, six years before the, um, uh, before the George Floyd murder, the, the killing of Michael Brown, um, the, the protests that followed immediately in the wake of Ferguson uh, precisely signaled the relation between what was happening on the ground um, in Ferguson, Missouri, just outside St. Louis, and what was happening in Palestine. So there was already a kind of connectedness that was not a one-way street. It was not, you know, the people on the ground in Ferguson protesting, saying, oh, we see you in Palestine. It was, you know, young folk on the ground in Palestine saying, um, this is what we did in terms of interaction. You know, these are ways to interact so that the police, you know, in, in order to organize, so that the police don't, aren't able to get at you. Right, uh, there are different ways of signaling to each other, sort of how to meet, you know, um, how to organize, sort of flash mobbing, things like that. Right, uh, there were very interesting protests uh, in Ferguson, for example, on a Saturday night at the Symph Symphony Orchestra in St. Louis, a kind of, you know, flash kind of event, um, uh, you know, that that picked up on forms of protest in other places. Um, and, and those kinds of um, circulations, I think, are very important, but precisely because they're not uh, unidirectional, they're multidirectional um, in, in, in the uh, variety and variation. Um, I do think the way you, you ask the question about the Americanization of, um, of anti-racism is a really both interesting and important one, not least precisely because Macron right, in the last couple of weeks has been saying that what is going on in France is an importation of these awful ideas from America that have to do with, I'm actually writing a, a piece about uh, what I'm calling uh, the, cancel, the, the canceling of critical race theory. Right? Um, so sort of the cancel culture applied to critical race theory that, that you know, it's not just American, right? I mean, it's taking place in Britain, it's taking place in France, it's taking place in other parts of uh, Europe and so on and so forth. Um, and, um, and, you know, so, so there is the danger on both ends of the political spectrum, so to speak, about this Americanization, right? Both as an object of, of dismissal, not even critique, right, of dismissal, oh, that's, that goes on over there, you're importing these foreign ideas here and they don't apply here. Um, so it becomes a kind of easy way to, to get rid of the way in which it takes hold in, in Paris and other places, right? Um, uh, but also that there is, you know, the, given the, uh, the um, overriding presence of, of Americanization, not least with respect to issues of race uh, and now technology, right? That's sort of ramified on top of it. There is a danger in which those forms of Americanization um, occlude, don't recognize that there are differences in different places. Um, and so how one keeps on paying careful attention um, to, the, to the local 
and what's happening in the local and the manifestation of struggles and how those struggles sort of, and and you know you're pointing to uh, roads must fall i think is a is a a key exemplification of this roads must fall emerged out of um, in this case cape town and then manifested across um, south africa very quickly um, and um, you know where roads as the index of lingering colonialism um, uh, became the symbol. And if you topple roads, you at least begin to make incursions into that. And then it got taken up in Oxford, in London, in Bristol, where, you know, everything, you know, as a shill put it to me, even the sky must fall, right? Everything must fall. Uh, uh, fees must fall and so on and so forth. But, but, but it had a kind of, you know, a counter sort of a geopolitical kind of emergence um, uh, that was important. I do, I do worry in a generalized sense that um, with digital technology, the instantaneity of eventfulness, you know, it's coming and going means that there's, the, you know, it's what a former uh, graduate student of mine calls outburst, right? There are outburst racism and there are outburst responses to racism. And the question becomes how you link those together in a sustained um, way of struggle against these formations and show how they have a common thread to them. Uh, even as they take on sort of local occurrence in different places. Uh, you know, and the instantaneity of algorithmic culture, the immediation of it, right? In both, both the temporal sense and the lack of, you know, uh, the mediation is immediate and then disappears, means that you're noticing these things and then forgetting about them. So memory gets erased very, very quickly. And, and, and so we need, I think, to come to terms with the way in which uh, digital culture sort of transforms um, um, you know, responses, uh, uh, sustainability of struggle over time, and so on. And I'll say just one more thing. Uh, I suspect it will come up through the conversation as well, but it's, uh, I think, a very uh, important point. It's linked to the... Uh, the point about privatization and the state. I mean, you, you sort of pointed and uh, Maria Paola's question sort of pointed to the relation between uh, the, the private and the public, the, the, um, uh, the way the state sort of functions in, in all of this uh, as well and the shift of power to, to large corporate uh, entities. I think what the digital has... Um, it didn't initiate, but it has um, ramified uh, and magnified um, uh, sort of through its privatizing kind of role is the emphasis that you're seeing reappearing at this moment in time in relation to the attack on critical race theory um, and anti-racism, the two sort of going together, right? Um, is a resurrection, a revival of colorblindness and post-raciality, right? That, that, that very language has been invoked on the right um, to define um, uh, both the individuation of racist expression. Oh, this is, you know, I mean, the, the British report the other day on race, the race report, there's no systemic racism in Britain. There's no institutional racism in Britain. Uh, Macron sort of, um, what Tajwif in, in, in uh, Paris uh, said explicitly the same thing in a piece he wrote uh, for Marianne, right? Um, there's no systemic racism in France. I mean, really, <laughs> right? Where's your evidence for this, right? Uh, so the, you know, there's this individuated um, expression repeated over time so it becomes true, right? Uh, without any recourse to evidence, without any recourse to data, it's just if you say it enough and it, and it gets permeated through um, digital repetition, you know, it, it, it becomes, it rules the roost, right? And so um, I, th I think what you're seeing happening 
is the shift from a kind of state or an attempt to shift from uh, systemic structural state underpinned racisms once again to this individuated expression through colorblindness and post-raciality. And there's, there's more to be said about that, but I'll leave it at this point. Thank you. Irina, we can hear your voice, your opinion about how the activists are resisting discrimination, environmental activism, and what sort of limitations we have, pro and cons regarding the use of this algorithmic culture. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but uh, I kind of engaged with the with the lecture of uh, Professor Goldberg in a, a bit of a different way. So uh, I don't know. Um, I kind of uh, I, I was feeling after the talk yesterday, I was I was feeling uh, that uh, we were a bit of a trapped in in a sort of a techno neutrality. So I want to push a bit the discussion to this uh, idea of techno power and techno science, and connect it hopefully with um, about the, uh, the topic of racism and and, the, and um, the contradictions of capitalism. So end of tracking capitalism uh, that uh, Professor Goldberg is talking about. So I wanna I wanna remember a little bit what he talked about and he hinted to the fact that the the, the so-called end of history and it was kind of on your lips, Professor, that um, there was some sort of a uh, end of nature uh, fantasy also, or, or a popular debate about the end of nature. And how crazy would it be to even talk about the end of technology in this context as a matter of concern, since you mentioned Bruno Latour. So for me, it would be interesting to, to jump into a discussion about robots. You, you mentioned the robots and it was very interesting and probably also very um, strong because it hits us in the most intimate corners of alienation, no? Who uses robots in uh, in uh, agriculture and and who uses robots to milk cows has been a very strong debate in in political ecology. Obviously inspired by political ecology, as you say. Um, and we have answers, you know, related to the fact that big farms are usually the ones that use or will use robots, and that big farms need uh, new metals to be extracted from the south on the one hand, and on the other hand, we have the big farms that will lead or lead already to big flus and epidemics. So, um, but the concern seems to be even in the middle of the pandemics is not so much about NAFTA, for example, but more about innovation and, and resilience. So so my, my concern is about this techno optimism that we are, we are witnessing. And I want to move even further to the topic of, of uh, industrial ag agriculture and robots. Um, for example, some sociologists, agrarians, talk about industrial agriculture and the fact that it is less dependent, um, less but still dependent on cheap labor, simply because technology cannot change photosynthesis as a principle of life. Not only that robots are not harvesting asparagus, the, there is still a temporality of, um, of cultivation which cannot be fully engineered. So I'm also pointing here to the scandal of last spring when in the middle of the pandemic uh, and the lockdown, Germany facilitated the transportation of thousands of workers from Eastern Europe to harvest our asparagus without proper safety protection. Um, but in the same time, um, I'm pointing to the fact that it may be the case that capitalist agriculture uh, cannot make peasantry redundant um, and uh, prefers to keep it as a surplus army, right? Um, and uh, that it is industrial agriculture that is dependent on essential workers and not only the other way around. So how do we think of this? Uh, without necessarily advocating for uh, some sort of a persistence of workers as, as poor, but to indicate that in this moment of technocracy and techno power, as you said, we have not yet solved the, the political questions that, that are, are also agrarian questions very much, especially in the context of economic, uh, ecological and health crisis. For example, one other provocation from sociologists of agriculture is that um, 
if only agriculture from the global south would be subsidized like in the north, probably cap capitalism would not be so, so profitable anymore. But of course, in, in agroecology, uh, there was uh, an uh, there are attempts to look at the unequal power relations, but not so much looking at the lingering racism and patriarchy as systemic. Another example that I want to give and to kind of provoke you to discuss is this uh, idea of um, also related to food, but in the context of overproduction. So it's not so let's not talk about labor anymore, but let's talk about consumption. Uh, we witness more and more food that is legally wasted nowadays. Uh, in, for example, in those cruise ships that you you showed us yesterday, um, and uh, where even the waiters cannot eat the leftovers, and you have a lot of food waste. And in this context, the techno optimism is not so much about food for all, but about preserving the hierarchy of, of consumption, no, and civilization as we know it. In, in the meantime, kind of dreaming of, 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 um, of themselves as uh, pilots uh, of Earth uh, as a spaceship. So it's a form of techno-optimism that translates actually into an impasse in politics and in ecological politics, because there is no, there is no actual choice between ecologizing and modernizing. Uh, there is no democratic debate whether to, to, to have a, a, a sort of a choice. Uh, and what we have is this new grand narrative of eco-modernism as geoengineering. We have the inventor of the term Anthropocene, Krusen, who actually proposed to send tons of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere just to cool the planet. But in the same time, we have other technologies proposed as desperate solution to energy scarcity. And we still have amnesia about the fact that nuclear testing itself was promoted in the Pacific as the good of mankind. Uh, and so whose energy scarcity and whose economic surplus are we talking about here? And what does it mean to, to repoliticize techno science in capitalism? For the good on, of mankind, we have been policing groups in racialized discourses about backward peasants pushed to become entrepreneurs, as you mentioned yesterday, or about Roma people uh, who <clears throat> are to, to be segregated and sterilized, uh, still in the imaginary of, of techno optimists. And uh, these are recurrent ap appeals of racism as practices of ordering and classification. So going back to your, to your writing, uh, we have a, a sort of a, a forgotten centuries of enslavement and imperialism, and we do not care so much about historicizing ontology itself. So it, where I want to aim as is how do we make this discussion not only about desiring de-alienation, which may be problematic in, in the context of surplus economy and capitalism, because we know that uh, both uh, capitalism and colonialism are appropriating value from any form of commons and commoning, even if it's never totalizing, like you mentioned yesterday, but any free gift of nature uh, is a desire to be a property. So what exactly does subjectification means in, in this context? And how to, to point to Mbembe's discussion that you had with how to accept the possible contingency of ontology in this context. These are sort of opening questions and, and uh, provocations that I want to bring to the table. Thank you. The provocation of the planetary um, uh, at this point. Let me, let me just uh, start lightheartedly. Um, because it's going to get rather depressing <laughs> very quickly after that. I was having a quick exchange about the question of uh, techno agriculture and cows yesterday with Maria Paula. Um, and I, uh, my response to the Russian example is we're in, we're in really deep trouble when the cows become robotified, <laughs> not just when the milking of the cows are robotified, right? <laughs> because then, of course, everything that is produced be, uh, becomes um, through innocent electronic. Uh, and I, I conveyed to a, a, a story I just heard about uh, a lecture Derrida was given, and this is the sort of um, lighthearted point, um, that he gave a lecture that everybody uh, took to be about cows, and they were completely befuddled. 
uh, you know, he was going on theoretically in the way Derrida used to for about two hours, um, talking about cows, right? And, you know, uh, everybody characteristically was taking copious notes because, of course, he must have been saying something deeply um, uh, convincing and so on and so forth, even though they couldn't make head or tail of it. And then they took a five minute break, a bio break, and uh, he, came, he came back for the discussion period. Uh, and he said, I was told during the, the break that the English um, expression for, the, for, for what I was talking about is chaos, not cows. <laughs> so he was giving a, a talk about chaos theory, <laughs> not about cows, but everybody took to be a, about cows, which might be an, an indicative of the kind of world we're inhabiting at the, <laughs> at the moment, the, the kind of... Um, uh, challenge of translation, right? Um, thank you, Renu, for um, really a set of very, very compelling questions um, and um, uh, having to do with uh, both the technicizing, of, you know, the long history of the technicizing, uh, not just of uh, agriculture, but, but actually of, as you put it, nature. Um, and the, uh, the way in which um, we're being challenged here um, uh, through both robotification and other forms of uh, techno insertion into every aspect of, um, of, of life, both ontologically and in terms of its, um, its uh, uh, potential sustainability. Uh, and I think the challenge you're posing is actually the, uh, the, the challenge um, of, of the planet uh, in, in point of fact, right? That is uh, both, both as a political undertaking uh, and of course in, um, in circulation with, in interaction with the, you know, the, the very conditions of, uh, of ontological, of ongoing ontological possibility, right? Um, that, uh, you know, the driving challenge of our time, the driving challenge of today, and not just of tomorrow, not just of the future, but the one we're facing today, and it's indeed part of the argument uh, in the book, is, um, is planetary survival, uh, actually, at this point in time. Right, um, the the fact that we're asphyxiating ourselves and not doing anything um, that comes close to addressing that um, that self asphyxiation um, on every register is is really the driving concern of. I mean, you know, I'm older. I'll, I'll survive sort of through this until I'm no longer here. But the next generation and the generation after that, this is the driving question of today. I mean, and it, it pervades every other question I think that we're facing uh, at, at, at this point um, in time. So the, um, the question of the future is a question of the now and it gets played out in different ways. It is of course the question of um, the undoing of the commons. I mean, the fact that, you know, since the late 1970s, uh, onwards, um, the, the, the possibility of a commons has been undercut at every point in time. And um, the, the, um, the corporatizing um, of digital technology has only exacerbated that, that every technological fix that this um, logic uh, promotes Right. That is, um, you know, the re the response of not even the right, but even the center, to the challenge, the planetary challenge of of environmental consideration, is to say technology will fix it. We will we will come up with techno fixes that will just um, push further and further out the 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 planetary challenges uh, we're facing. And um, I think the counter argument is that every technological uh, fix that is proposed deepens or at least re, um, uh, re repurposes, you might say, 
um, uh, the, the depth of the environmental challenges that it takes to, uh, to fix. So, you know, every, um, I mean, take, take wind power just as one example among others, right? Um, you know, wind power at the moment provides a very small proportion of uh, energy wherever it's being, uh, now I think the largest amount of uh, energy that in any place that is being produced by wind power is 15%, 15% of the, um, of, of the energy in, you know, in, in the United States, it's like 2% of power. Uh, at the moment, so it's st still a very, very small proportion, and not, you know, as you mentioned, not unlike nuclear power, which was proposed as the um, the solution to energy uh, production. Um, you know, uh, the same here, but but more deeply, energy power, uh, um, sorry, wind power, in order to uh, in order to produce the levels of energy that it does produce, you know, uses carbon product, carbon produced product. I mean, even if that were addressed, there are other considerations at work. You know, there are large wind farms being placed in the sea. What is the impact on sea life uh, that it's producing and so on? You know, which of course is the center source of, um, uh, of bioreproduction. What's it doing to coral reefs? Right, which is the are the largest form of biodiversity, and so on and so forth. So, so every and I, I think you can do this with any proposed fix, any proposed technological fix. What are the costs? And I don't mean economic costs. What are the environmental costs, right, to the proposed fix that don't at least exacerbate the very thing that it's that that it's taking itself to address? And I think that that is an excess of the of the problematic logic at work, right? So um, short of dramatically scaling back on consumption, both agricultural and every other kind, I mean, really dramatically, right? Um, uh, De Castro, for example, the other day, Bavaris De Castro, um, not so long ago, did, a, did an interview. He said, you know, we're gonna have to get used to living without cell phones, right? Um, what's it gonna take? To, you know, so the very technology that we're uh, that that we've made ourselves dependent on is part of the very thing that is producing um, our demise, right? And it's that nexus that I think is uh, um, you know at the heart. It, it it it's not it's not a technological challenge. It's a logical challenge, right? If I can put it in those terms, um, and then. You know, the, the question of race, the, 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 the play, the role, the extent of race and racism in all of this, I think uh, it's important to see the shifts and this lines up with uh, Bruno's comments as well. Uh, the shift that we've seen taking place before our very eyes um, from, you know, that I spoke about it at some length yesterday from, um, you know, what Foucault identified as the emergence of biopower through the 18th and into the 19th and 20th centuries, and the way in which biopower in both its regulatory and disciplinary forms took hold of us, right? Um, uh, regulatory at the more generalized sense um, of, of society and the state, um, you know, the, the welfareism became a form of regulatory power and, and so on. And disciplinary power, as he puts it, drilling down on the body itself, right? Um, and the way in which individuation on individual bodies became modes of, of control, that has shifted. You know, I don't want to say it's given way to, but there's a, there's a, a, a dramatic ramping up of the supplementary power of, of information. So info power has displaced in some ways, but ramified in other ways, the effects of, of, of biopower. And the kinds of things I was, uh, I was pointing to yesterday are the emergence, uh, you know, both, both the, the dramatic um, data feeds that each of us individually and collectively are feeding into the, the, uh, the system of informational power. Um, 
you know, by using our cell phones, by using the kinds of apparatuses we're, we're on at the moment uh, and, and so on and so forth, right? And the way in which that power is being um, um, uh, refined, right? Um, and one of the key examples I mentioned was biometric, uh, the, the emergence of biometrics in um, significant parts of Africa, South Africa, Kenya, among other places, Nigeria. Uh, and, um, you know, certainly in India and in less um, visible terms in China, right? And what biometric power is doing is it's combining all forms of info feed into an in individuated profile of each person, right? So that uh, you know, if you take the case of India, which is probably furthest along in sort of defining it, right, your, um, your birth certificate, uh, any property you own, who you marry, um, uh, your bank accounts, uh, your, your, your um, health profile uh, um, are all fed into a, an identity right, which is an identity card or an identity number, really, a, um, right, a, a, a profile, much like a, a, what's the name of the thing that you get on, um, on products, right, that, uh, uh, that when you buy something, they click on it and it shows the price. Um, I forget the exact name of it, but the, um, uh, you know, price each tag. person, sorry? Price tag. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that, that, that tag, right? Um, uh, that, that, that you're, um, you're getting one as an individual and all your information is being fed into that. And in India, uh, your capacity to actually purchase anything was predicated on your having an identification number. It was ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. Right? Even, a, even buying a cell phone would, would, would uh, would require it and that got overruled, right? But you can see the way in which the, the, the identity profile through information is fed in so that the state effectively has a complete identity picture of, or think they have a uh, an identity picture of who you are. The, um, Larry Page, the co-founder of Google uh, says, you know, we know better than you do what you desire and we're going to give it to you. To which my response is, if only I knew myself, right? So kind of, uh, I mean, I don't even know what I want at any point in time. And you're telling me, you know better than me what I want. And you're going to tell me what I want, right? And you can see the, the, the determining without becoming techno-determinist, the way in which the narrowing down of the, um, of the range of possibilities of what it is to act in a human way, right? Or act in any way uh, it, 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 it is being profiled over here. So um, race is being um, sewn, threaded in to this set of consider uh, uh, considerations by exactly by profiling in the algorithmic software that is being produced. You see this in facial recognition uh, considerations. You know, how is it that Black people are less recognized by facial recognition uh, technology? Well, it's in part because of the data set on which that technology is being um, developed, right? So, um, uh, you know, uh, Google started its, or uh, facial recognition technology developers started their, um, uh, their experimentation on cats, right? So they got, they got uh, the technology to recognize what a cat is by showing it 10,000 images of cats. And then through machine learning, right, eventually it was able to say, oh, the next iteration that I'm showing, that's a cat, and that's a cat but that's not, right? Well, when it, when it came to human beings, Google and other technology development uh, companies, um, were developing their profile for recognizing human faces on the basis of the set of people who were white, right? So that if you had a photograph uh, that, you know, if you took that technology uh, and said, okay, we want to feed into 
uh, that data set, right? Um, so that it continues to develop who counts as human and, and who does not in facial recognition considerations. If you fed into it a, a photograph of a white guy and a black guy, either next to each other or one on top of each other uh, and so on, right? What the technology did would, is that it would narrow down the photograph to the white face and feed that face into the database and exclude the black face. So it was reproducing the very condition that it was taking itself to address. And, um, you know, so this in a way poses a, a, a racial dilemma, right? On the one hand, you want to say, right? I mean, everybody should be equally recognized. Why are you excluding people on the basis of race? That's racial discrimination, right? Uh, and on the other, you want to say, great, I'm not in that database, right? I'm not being profiled in, in exactly that kind of way. But of course, when you're not being profiled in that kind of way, you're also being delimited from whatever the virtues are of that system, like being able to use facial recognition on your, to open your, your, your cell phone or other, you know, you might be pulled aside at the airport precisely because you're not in the database, right? Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't say you won't be pulled aside. It's, it's that you more likely will be pulled aside precisely because they don't recognize who you are. So there, there are all kinds of ways in which this plays out. It has been a pleasure to listen to you all.